everybody. Thank you for attending the webinar on low temperature gas plasma sterilization technology. This is going to be presented by Emeritus Professor Lawrence J. Walsh AO, who is a specialist in special needs dentistry based in Brisbane, where he served for 36 years on the academic staff of the University of Queensland School of Dentistry, including 21 years as Professor of Dental Science and 10 years as the head of school. Since retiring in December 2020, Laurie has remained active in hands-on bench research work, supervising many research students at UQ who work in advanced technologies, biomaterials and in clinical microbiology. Laurie has served as Chief Examiner in Microbiology for the RACDS for 21 years and as the editor of the ADA Infection Control Guidelines for 12 years. His published research work includes over 330 journal papers with a citation count of over 15,400 in the literature. Laurie also holds patents in seven families of dental technologies and is currently ranked in the top 0.2% of global scientists. Murray was recently made an Officer of the Order of Australia and a Life Member of ADAQ in 2020 in recognition of his contributions to dentistry. This presentation looks at a number of new sterilisation technologies. So why do we sterilise items? It's all about breaking the chain of infection this concept of the chain of infection underpins all modern infection control measures. If we can eliminate the organisms, then we're not going to be putting our patients at risk of the transmission of infection in the clinical workplace setting. If we think about the various components of the chain of infection, like a physical chain as shown here, then when we use sterilization, we're interrupting this chain by breaking the links at two points, as is shown here. Now, when we think about the transmission of infection and the importance of sterilization in the clinical workplace, in the NHMRC 2019 guidelines, it points out that the likelihood of a healthcare-associated infection varies. It varies according to the nature of the pathogens that are present, their virulence, that is their ability to cause disease, how they're transmitted, but also the complexity of the procedure being done and its site. And this comes down to its invasiveness. Are we going into tissues that are normally sterile? In other words, are we doing a surgical procedure? Because the more invasive the procedure, the greater the risk is going to be. And this principle underlies the logic of the Spalding classification, which has been used in infection control since 1968, breaking particular instruments and devices and their use into a critical site, a semi-critical site, a non-critical site, and then more recently introduced by the CDC consideration around environmental services in a healthcare setting, such as those that are housekeeping services versus those that are frequently touched, particularly by clinicians. And obviously the risk is highest at the critical end in terms of the transmission of a healthcare associated infection. And this is why, for example, for surgery, we need items that have been sterilized and then they have been wrapped or packaged to retain them in a sterile form until the point of use. This Spalding classification underpins all of the various standards on instrument reprocessing around the world, including in Australia. So for instruments that are used in critical sites, so these are critical devices, they're intended to enter or cut into, for example, oral mucosa, gingiva, or bone, those need to be sterilized and kept sterile to the point of use, as opposed to semi-critical devices such as those that are used for non-surgical dentistry. Let's just spend a moment thinking about the challenge that we have to inactivate different types of microbial life forms. This is often expressed as a hierarchy from the toughest 
to the easiest. So we begin with bacterial spores, and even within spores, some are more resistant than others. Moving on then to mycobacteria, to the small protein-coated non-enveloped viruses, also including, for example, papillomavirus, then to the fungi, then to our ordinary vegetative bacteria, and finally, as the easiest to inactivate, the medium to large and lipid-coated viruses. We can also add to this list another level of difficulty, which of course would be the prions, for example, those involved in creutzfeldt jakob disease. And then you can also add into the overall scheme protozoal cysts. This concept of difficulty is very important because it explains to us the difference between sterilization, which is an absolute, you have either achieved it or not, versus disinfection, which can be high, intermediate, or low level. And we can see the scope of what different types of disinfectants will cover, with the low level being shown in the black arrow covering the easy viruses, the vegetative bacteria and the fungi, the intermediates covering most of the non-lipid protein-coated viruses, and the high-level disinfectants going through up to the mycobacteria and even some of the less resistant spores. But only sterilization will inactivate everything. So with that introduction, let's now get into the main meat of this lecture's topic. So there are lots of different methods that have been developed to sterilize items or to disinfect them. Physical methods or chemical methods. Traditionally in dentistry, we've used physical methods such as moist heat or steam under pressure, autoclaving, and to a much lesser extent, dry heat. Chemical methods of sterilization have been extensively used in hospitals and also in the production of different devices such as disposable dental instruments typically using things like ethylene oxide. But there is another method of chemical sterilization which is important to know about, and that's using plasma. For example, hydrogen peroxide gaseous plasma. Whichever of these different methods we're going to be using, there are a couple of essential principles we need to bear in mind. The first principle is that we must use the appropriate conditions and we must verify those in a process called validation to make sure that we've got the agent there for the right time in the right concentration and temperature and pressure and so on. The second concept is that the items must be free of bio burden. They must have been cleaned because if they're not, we're not going to render them sterile. And Thirdly, we must be able to get complete contact between the agent which is doing the sterilization and all the nooks and crannies, the surfaces and crevices of the device to be sterilized in the first place. So the whole process of verification using, for example, biological indicators and from cycle to cycle chemical indicators is designed to show us that we are actually achieving that. And for different types of processes, there are different types of indicators. So the biological indicators differ between steam and dry heat and plasma. The chemical indicators differ between steam and dry heat and plasma. So it's very important to use the right type of indicator when we're using different types of sterilization processes. As well, there are some methods where the removal of air is particularly problematic, and that's the case for steam sterilization. And that's why we have things like the Bowie-Dick test, which has been around since the 1960s, as a test for air removal for steam sterilization. Let me now make a couple of comments about high-velocity hot air sterilizers, which are a form of dry heat sterilizers with a shorter cycle time. They achieve this because they're using a higher temperature. 
Typical dry heat units run at 160 degrees for two hours or 170 for one hour. These run at 190 for 12 minutes. The air is forced around in a jet curtain design using a special design of chamber so there isn't turbulence in the hot air. Of course, at 109 degrees, there are lots of problems with many things that are heat sensitive, and that includes instruments as well as materials. Obviously, with this temperature, the load is going to be dry throughout, but when the cycle ends, these items are very, very hot, 109 degrees. Hence, the extended cooling time after the sterilizing cycle is complete is an important practical issue and indeed a limitation. The other thing is while there is no moisture present, so the likelihood of corrosion occurring is very, very small, there are metallurgical effects, for example, on the temper and behavior of different sort of metals because of the temperature. So it's certainly not a panacea. And that's the reason why around the world, in Australia, through Australian standards, ADA guidelines, and overseas through CDC, there's a general feeling against using dry heat. And the ADA infection trial guidelines state that dry heat is not recommended for routine use for sterilizing dental instruments and equipment. Just reinforcing my earlier point, when dry heat units are used, you need a different type of biological indicator or spore test using an even tougher target than the normal Geobacillus stereothermophilus. And that particular target is known as Bacillus atrophius. Now I want to spend some time talking about plasma sterilization. So first of all, what is plasma? Plasma is one of the four states of matter, and it's defined as being an ionized or energized gas where there is an equal number of positively and negatively charged particles. If we think about the four different states of matter in terms of a sense of connection between them, when something is a solid, it's in a rigid, highly organized, low energy state, such as, for example, ice. When it's in a liquid, we have these reasonably strong bonds between different components. As we add energy in, those bonds get separated apart, and now the different molecules can float around. Of course, this is the state of a gas. But if we then add further energy in, and that could be heat, it could be microwaves or radio frequency energy or even high voltage, we strip the electrons off. And this is how we end up with particles that, of course, are either positively charged because they've lost electrons or they're negatively charged because they've gained electrons. Now, because of the very high energy state that a plasma is, you often see that it gives off light. And you've probably all seen, or you might even have, these types of plasma discharge displays. And of course, plasma discharge was the original technology of the flat screen television made famous by, of course, Samsung. Today, we don't see these very often because they suffer from all sorts of problems like burn-in and flicker, radio frequency interference and buzzing. And today, there's much more efficient types of flat screens, such as organic LEDs and liquid crystal screens. But it's just a really good example of the way that plasma technology has evolved into different types of applications. So if we want to sterilize something, what sort of gases could we use to generate a plasma? Well, obviously, atmospheric gases like nitrogen and oxygen could be suitable. Ozone could be suitable. However, what's different about these gases is how much energy it takes to strip away the electrons and to ionize them. And this is the dissociation energy shown in electron volts. And you can notice that it takes a lot lower energy to dissociate hydrogen peroxide when it's in a gaseous form and its nearest relative, which is triatomic oxygen or ozone. Ozone, of course, is so unstable that it's very difficult to work with and you can't generate it and store it in a cylinder like you can with other sorts of gases. Hydrogen peroxide, of course, we can stabilize and have in a liquid, so it's much more convenient. So this is why hydrogen peroxide is the most common material that's been used to generate a gas that is then activated to form a plasma for sterilization. 
So in order to achieve an effective plasma, we need to do that under very, very low pressure, deep vacuum conditions. And we need something to excite the material. And that could be radio frequency, it could be microwaves, it could even be high voltage. Then we've got a whole range of different products which are produced. And these free radicals, oxygen free radicals that are generated, these are the things that interact with the organics, with the viruses, with the bacteria, with the fungi. And they literally chemically erode away their surfaces and oxidize them. And this is what kills them off. This is a well-known technology. It's been around for quite a long period of time. And how it works is really well described. In this article from 2002, there's an allusion to what some of the main radicals are that actually kill off microorganisms. Talking about the hydroperoxyl, which is the OOH, and the hydroxyl, which is the OH radical. But there's also the O radical. There's even potentially the O3, the ozone radical as well. But it's the OH one which is regarded as being probably the most efficient for inactivating microbes. That's because it's the one with the greatest oxidizing potential. It's the one that can disrupt and destroy the membranes of cells. For example, by processes like lipid peroxidation. Now, the really important thing to remember about this form of plasma is that it's operating at a low temperature. That's why it's often called cold plasma as opposed to hot plasma, which you might get, for example, when you have a lightning strike or electrical discharge. The temperature range is not that much above body temperature, typically around 45 to 50 degrees. So let's try to put all that together into a bit of a process. We've got our organisms we're going to introduce them to gaseous hydrogen peroxide. Gaseous hydrogen peroxide by itself is an extremely good microbicidal agent. It's able to inactivate and kill organisms because it's a very, very powerful oxidant. So that begins the killing process. When that is activated or if you like pulled apart or cracked by the generation of plasma, that's when we get those additional oxygen free radicals that are even more potent again. As the generation of plasma continues, it eventually cracks and breaks down all of the hydrogen peroxide into its simplest form. And that gives you the end products, which are completely non-toxic, normal diatomic oxygen and water. So unlike ethylene oxide, which is a method that's been used in hospitals, which is incredibly toxic gas, the end products of gaseous hydrogen peroxide plasma sterilization are actually oxygen and water, which can be vented to the atmosphere. So different forms of activation have been used with hydrogen peroxide plasma devices. And the actual technology has been used for quite a long time, but almost exclusively in a big hospital setting. It's only very recently that it started to be used in a small office dental clinic type of environment. Here's just some recent research just showing how potent the effects of the plasma can be onto the surface of, in this case, culture plates of bacteria. So here we have a culture plate of E. coli before and afterwards, and we can actually see the physical colonies have been disrupted. And we can see the same thing here for colonies of Staph aureus on a culture plate. So how long has this technology been used as a sterilizing method in a healthcare setting? The answer is actually for quite a long time. The original concept was patented in 1987, and the first sterilizers of this type were marketed in the US in 1993. What I'm showing you here is the official Centers for Disease Control webpage on hydrogen peroxide gas plasma sterilization, and the US guidelines, which the current version is 2008. And they point out a couple of very interesting points which reinforce some comments I've already made to you. Stresses the low temperature nature, the reactive nature of the plasma, the fact there is no toxic residues left behind, and that the sterilization is occurring in a very low moisture environment. 
So this technology has been used in hospitals and clinics, including for things ranging from ophthalmic lenses used in, for example, cataract surgery, used through to traditional medical instruments for surgery, through to things like dental handpieces and suction tips, and extensively for optical and electromedical devices, which are electronic. The units that are used in hospitals range in size from about 30 litres up to enormous large units with chamber sizes of around 200 plus litres. And they're used to turn around things like endoscopes, laser fibres, implantable electronics like pacemakers, ophthalmic lenses, ultrasound devices, and so on. And one reason they can be used for such an extensive range of devices is because it's a low temperature technology. When you look at the compatibility of hydrogen peroxide gaseous plasma, it's suitable for things that are made out of stainless steel or titanium or aluminium or glass or ceramic. However, there are certain things that it's not compatible with because those things will absorb the hydrogen peroxide vapor and it will cause it to condense. So those things are spongy by nature. So we're talking about cellulose, paper, cotton. Those will trap the vapor, turn it back into liquid, and that will upset the gaseous phase distribution and hence the generation of plasma later on. Here we can see a table listing the compatibility for a whole range of different sorts of medical devices that are processed today in hospitals using these short cycle hydrogen peroxide gaseous plasma units. What about plastics? Almost all the common plastics that you can think of, and certainly those found in medical devices, polyethylenes, polypropylenes, teflons, silicones, polycarbonates can all be sterilized using this method without any degradation whatsoever. So you can start to appreciate why this has become a bit of an interesting topic in recent years and of the three different sorts of chemical sterilization technologies that are used around the world. It's the one which is now starting to dominate because of this environmentally friendly lack of toxic residues type of characteristic, and also because it's much faster than things like ethylene oxide. And it doesn't have any of the complex requirements of, for example, using gamma sterilization. So let's look at what a typical dental clinic based unit for hydrogen peroxide plasma sterilization might actually look like. So here is a unit that is approved by the TGA for rapid throughput gas plasma sterilization. It has a chamber of 14 litres, which is about two thirds the chamber size of a typical steam sterilizer. It opens up from the top, as you can see, and inside that unit, we can see at the base of the chamber, there's a connector. And this is where the specialized cartridges or pouches connect to. But actually it's a little bit more sophisticated because the chamber itself has a barcode reader, which is able to read the barcodes on the different types of cartridges and packages which are loaded in to check things like the expiry date on them in terms of the shelf life of the hydrogen peroxide. And that also informs the sterilizer of the correct cycle parameters to use to make sure that that selection is effectively idiot proof. Here's an even smaller one where the chamber size is only seven liters. And it's broken up into two parts that are connected by some pipes. So the left hand unit is the chamber itself with the touch screen and the controller. And the vacuum pump unit, which removes the air, is the right hand side unit. Notice that the cycle time for a single package is eight minutes of which four of those is for sterilization. And obviously there's a warm up and a venting phase at the end. And to do an entire chamber is 20 minutes. And unlike a steam sterilizer where we need to spend time organizing the chamber very, very carefully, that's not the case with these chambers. Other than the rule of don't cover the vacuum port, 
you can actually fill the chamber up completely by literally stacking things right on top of each other, package upon package upon package. So effectively, all of the seven liters is usable. So this is quite a different concept from steam sterilization. And this partly relates to the nature of what's happening here. So here we can see those different sort of modes. So in the top mode, we've got the specialized connectors linking onto just one package. And that package contains the hydrogen peroxide. It connects up to the specialized ports and that will do the items inside that one package. So that's that eight minute mode. Whereas the chamber mode, where we use the entire capacity of the chamber, of course, is a longer cycle because the air removal, the introduction of the vaporized hydrogen peroxide, all those things are going to take longer. So it's pretty clear that the sort of pouches that are used are fairly specialized. So here they are. This is the seven minute variety. And the larger one on the right hand side is the 14 minute variety. Tucked in the leading edge on the left hand side is the stored stabilized high concentration hydrogen peroxide. That's already built in. And then at the end of those, you can see the barcode and the manufacturing date, which is read by the sterilizer through its barcode reader in order to verify that the package is in date before it begins the sterilizing cycle, which is very important. Now, there are other ways that you can wrap items in beyond putting them simply into these types of dedicated containers. You can wrap them in polypropylene non-woven wrap. So KimGuard is one example for that. But obviously, whatever you use has to be compatible with hydrogen peroxide gas plasma. And polypropylene was one of those plastics that is as is polyethylene. So a special high density form of polyethylene made by DuPont is called Tyvek. And Tyvek is used to make these specialized pouches. And these you can use in the same way as you would use paper plastic pouches in a steam sterilizer. You can use Tyvek pouches for hydrogen peroxide gas plasma sterilization. And then you seal them off using a specialized heat sealer. You can't use paper containing pouches inside a hydrogen peroxide gas plasma sterilization unit. Here we can see that sealing being done in the dedicated unit. There are of course also cassettes that you can place items inside and these of course will be porous to allow the exit of air and the entry of the hydrogen peroxide vapor. So having now seen what the technology looks like, let's now go through the cycle to understand the events that are occurring. Remember that all of these are happening at a low temperature, just a little bit above body temperature, and that temperature is designed to reduce the chance of condensation of the hydrogen peroxide from its gaseous phase back into its liquid phase. So the whole process begins with the removal of air, the vacuum phase. And this is why these sterilizers can treat items which have lumens, which are hollow. When the air is removed, then the concentrated hydrogen peroxide is vaporized. This is done using a special linear jet generator with a heated tip. So the vapor comes out and that then diffuses through the load and the pressure rises to push the hydrogen peroxide vapor onto every surface of the item. So it goes through the special packages, through the Tyvek pouches to reach all the parts that are inside the load. At this stage of the game, the hydrogen peroxide vapor is already oxidizing the surfaces of bacteria and viruses and fungi. So sterilization has already begun at this point. Then the pressure is reduced and then energy is added, typically as microwaves, radio frequency or high voltage. And this is what generates the plasma. And the plasma creates those oxygen radicals that are even more potent as oxidizing agents. And this takes us through the sterilization process. Then the water and the oxygen, which are produced 
as end products are vented into the atmosphere through special cartridges that ensure that there are no organisms released into the air, so that's a HEPA filter, and through a special chemical cartridge that gets rid of all the oxygen radicals. And then the entire sequence is then repeated, and this gives us the overkill to achieve the sterility level of a survival probability of less than one in a million. And at the end, at the end of the second cycle, that is, we can now completely vent everything and now equalize the pressure so the chamber can be opened. Note that because the items are coming out only slightly warm, there's actually no need to cool them afterwards. They can, in fact, be used immediately, which is one reason why very delicate, very specialized items that are in high demand in hospitals are typically processed using this method. So obviously the pressure inside the chamber is going to change as we go through the uh, preheating or warming through to the pumping phase to remove the air through to the pressure rising as the hydrogen peroxide is injected in the vapor form and that diffuses through. And then obviously that's all going to get cycled around in the repetition of the cycle to achieve that final sterility assurance level. So we can record the data in the same way as we can record the data for pressure changes using a steam sterilizer. So let's look at some of the things which give plasma sterilization a bit of a personality. The first one is about moisture. For the same reason we don't want things that trap hydrogen peroxide vapor and create liquid, we don't want moisture, that is water, on the load because that's going to upset the phase distribution as we go through the sterilizing process. So items must be completely dry before they go into the chamber. The second thing is that like a steam sterilizer at the start of the day, the unit does need to warm up. And the warming up has two parts. There's the warming up of the linear jet component, which is the injector, which generates the actual vapor from the liquid hydrogen peroxide. So that part has to be warmed, that needs to be warmed up. And there's the actual chamber itself that needs to be warmed up to around 40 degrees to stop condensation. So that's done by a preheating mode, where you can see a progress indicator. And once that's reached the point where the item are ready to be loaded, then the sterilizing menu will appear. Now the hydrogen peroxide concentration is nominally 58%, so it's specially stabilized at that concentration. Now note that that concentration is many times higher than what you would use even for an in-office bleach. And the cartridges and the special pouches that contain it have obviously got some stabilizers in it in order to ensure there's a sufficient shelf life but in order to verify that it's within life, then this is where the barcode reader comes into its own. The arrows shown in the middle diagram show the connection ports where the individual cells are accessed to take the hydrogen peroxide from the cartridge and then use that for the cycle. And there are two distinct cells so that those two sterilizing processes that go through in each individual cycle use separate hydrogen peroxide. And if you've got an out of date cartridge or pouch that will be rejected by the sterilizer and the cycle won't even start in the first place. So there's a fair bit of technology built into these special cartridges to contain the hydrogen peroxide and also built into the pouch. And that helps to remove problems like out of date peroxide or someone trying to select an inappropriate cycle. The unit actually knows what you put in because the barcodes are different for a 14 minute large pouch than from a seven minute small pouch. When you go to the full chamber mode, as I mentioned earlier, the entire volume is usable so you can literally stack things on top of each other. So what are some of the do's and don'ts? Well, things that would absorb liquids are obviously out. And I've mentioned cotton and paper and cardboard and linen and towels and gauze and things like that being some fairly obvious examples of those types of things which would be contraindicated. And you can see those listed 
in the manufacturer's instructions for use here. What affects how well the process works? Well, the first group of things are the same as for steam sterilization. How clean was the load item? How much buyer burden was present? And then obviously the parameters that are used, but because these are effectively selected through the barcode, it's fairly difficult to imagine a scenario where you wouldn't end up with the correct parameters being chosen. The main thing you can get wrong is to put in a load which is not dry. What about hollow and lumened items? So single channel stainless steel items can be processed. For example, if it's 0.7 of a millimeter, then it can be 500 millimeters long or less. The manufacturer's data show a whole range of different scenarios for hollow items. And as you would know, as the diameter becomes smaller, the difficulty increases. As the length of the pipe becomes longer, the difficulty increases. So I want you to focus on the two areas that are highlighted with the pink ellipses. So it is possible to do items which are even less than 0.5 of a millimeter in diameter. In fact, the manufacturer has tested down to 0.25 of a millimeter. And they've even tested things which are over two meters in length at either one or two millimeters in diameter. So these dimensions are a much greater range than what you would find in a suction tip, for example, or in a dental high-speed handpiece. And this is why dental high-speed handpieces, air turbines, can be sterilized using these types of units. There is, in fact, even a specialized type of helix test where the biological indicator goes inside the end rather than a chemical indicator. And that's put through a process. You then take it out and you look for a color change visually. However, this is not generally used by most manufacturers of hydrogen peroxide gas sterilizers. Let's just talk through a bit about what happens at the end of the cycle when we're venting everything. So the processes are going to be vented out through the back of the unit through the little filter, the HEPA filter shown with the blue arrow on the right hand side. So the hydrogen peroxide is going to be fully decomposed to water and oxygen. So the HEPA filter is going to block any bacteria or viruses or fungi coming out. And there's another little cartridge which is going to inactivate and trap any ozone or oxygen radicals that are remaining. So we only get regular diatomic oxygen released out. Now, of course, both of those things are going to have a limited life. And practically, their use life is about six months. So the manufacturer recommends replacing the HEPA filter and the ozone cartridge every six months. Now, when the chamber is opened, once the venting is finished and the cycle is complete, the items will feel slightly warm because the maximum temperature in the injector is 57 degrees and inside the chamber it's going to be around 40 degrees. So the packages will feel slightly warm. However, the person unloading does need to wear gloves because there is a very, very small possibility that there might be traces of hydrogen peroxide remaining. So it's actually to protect their hands from chemical irritation. Because if there was hydrogen peroxide residues, even in a very, very small amount, then that would clearly be able to irritate the skin. Now it's readily reversed by the application of any type of vitamin E product. But from a purely Oc Health and Safety point of view, if you saw an item that came out and it was actually wet, then that would not be water. It could be wet with hydrogen peroxide. And so while the items aren't hot, it is important to wear gloves when removing items from the chamber at the end because of that very remote possibility of there being traces of liquid hydrogen peroxide. So let's now go on to talk about how we assess the performance of the sterilizer in terms of its normal validation under the Australian standards for sterilization and instrument reprocessing. Well, there's not an Australian equipment standard for hydrogen peroxide gas plasma sterilizers. The Australian New Zealand standard 4187 refers to the ISO standard, which is 14937, which goes through gas plasma sterilization 
in quite some detail. The requirements are also picked up in Table 2 of the Australian New Zealand Standard 4187. So let's look at those key points. First of all, at the end of a cycle, you're going to check that the packages are not breached, they're not torn, they're not broken, they're not punctured. There is going to be data recording for each cycle, and that will record the temperature, the pressure, and the exposure time. There are chemical indicators. You must have a chemical indicator included with each item that is external on the outside, and you can apply that, as you'll see in a moment, using a special tape. You can use internal class 4 chemical indicators that is optional, and in terms of air removal tests, because of the nature of the process, an air removal test, such as a Bowie Dick test, is not actually required under the different standards. And using a process challenge device, which is another test for air removal, is also not mandatory. It is optional, and you would only do it if recommended by the manufacturer. There is a special type of biological indicator or spore test, and the frequency of that is as stated by the manufacturer. And of course, there is an annual validation. So much like a steam sterilization validation, you would be doing this at least once every year. So let's look at what these devices look like. So on the left, this is the specialized chemical indicator tape designed for hydrogen peroxide vapor. We have chemical indicator strips. And as I showed you earlier, there is that optional Helix PCD. These are the chemical indicator strips made for hydrogen peroxide vapor. They change color from pink to blue. Very simple to use. So at the end of a cycle, much like a steam sterilizer cycle, we look at the display screen. We review the data which has been printed out. There's a little USB printer that prints the data out. We read through that, and then we look at the chemical indicators on the outside of the packages, and we review the chemical indicators on the inside, and we obviously reject items that are non-conforming. So hopefully the screen looks like this, shows us that we've got the exposure time, everything is okay, we've got a pass result, and obviously if we show a fail result, then we need to reject those items as being non-conforming. Let's have a look at the printouts. These printouts are thermal printouts, so they will fade over about five years. So it's good practice to either photocopy them, photograph them with a mobile phone, for example, or scan them, for example, on an MFD or a flatbed scanner. So that way you don't need to worry about the data fading. So this is the short form data for a pass cycle on the left and a failed cycle on the right hand side. And then this is the long format data with a pass on the left and a fail on the right hand side. Notice it shows you the heating time, the drying time. It shows you the temperature. It gives you the base pressure, the diffusion pressure and temperature for both of the sterilizing cycles and shows you the overall exposure time and temperature as well as the details of the operator. So this is the recommended format to use the long format because it does capture the data which you need. And you can see there's a space to sign those off. Now, when it comes to your annual validation, there are specially made biological indicators. You can't use the spore test you would use for a steam sterilizer. You need to have a biological indicator that has special little holes in the lid. And several companies make biological indicators and you can read these after two days, as I showed you before, and look for a color change. But there are also varieties on the market that give you a rapid readout in 20 minutes. And this is what these look like. So these require a specialized reader, which has a spectrophotometer built into it. So you can actually get a readout in 20 minutes using fluorescence. Or you simply wait and you can see a color change, as I showed you earlier, after 48 hours. So finally, what sort of tender love and care do these types of sterilizers need? So let's look at the, the user maintenance side and then finish by just reviewing some of the main things we've learned in this lecture. So weekly, it's a simple wipe down of the chamber with a 
clean, damp towel. There's no scale buildup because we're not working with steam. So we don't need to use citric acid or some sort of descaling solution. There won't be any debris that builds up. The chamber will look visibly clean. Every six months, you've got this job of finding, screwing off and replacing the HEPA filter and the ozone cartridge. Very simple task. And when you get the annual service, typically the service engineer will replace the oil. It is possible to do that as a user, but normally that would be done by a service engineer. This is to make sure the vacuum pump retains its complete functionality. And at that stage, the manufacturer would recheck the calibration of thermocouples and one good thing about being able to track the performance of the unit is it is possible to link the unit to a cloud-based system to actually track data and record that and that can allow some monitoring of different issues and the unit itself will store internally in its own memory 80 complete cycles of data and once it gets to 80 it will then start to overwrite so you've got the chance to go back and have a look at those and that includes those graphs of pressure versus time that I showed you before. So this is what the replacing the HEPA filter looks like. It's a simple twist and replace. So that's something that any capable staff member could do. And likewise, the uh, ozone conversion cartridge is just a question of removing two small knobs and popping the cartridge off and then placing a new one on. So having considered a couple of different improvements and innovations in sterilizing technology, we can see that the gaseous plasma sterilization is certainly highly efficacious. It does that very quickly because it combines the oxidizing ability of the vapor followed by the oxidizing ability of the oxygen radicals that are created by it. It's able to penetrate very well, including into very long and very small diameter hollow items. And that's an important and very useful characteristic for a dental setting. There is a range of materials that is compatible with, including some things that are very sensitive to heat or would not withstand conventional steam sterilizing. So it's not just a convenience, there's also a compatibility aspect. What comes out the back is free of microorganisms and doesn't contribute anything to the environment. You could also argue that the total energy consumption of this process is much less than using a steam sterilizer because you're not having to generate steam from water. So there's an energy efficiency in there as well. And it's for these sorts of reasons that this is being looked at much more so today as one of these additional common methods of sterilization. So hopefully through this presentation, you've gained some insight into a couple of different ways that we can think about sterilization. And most importantly, you've now got an appreciation of the difficulty of trying to inactivate different forms of microbial life. And hopefully that idea of this hierarchy of complexity of kill and inactivation, and the chain of infection. Those concepts will stay with you whenever you're thinking about approaches to sterilization. Well, I hope you all found that uh, presentation interesting and informative. My apologies that we had a couple of little technical issues there with the sound, but I think we've got those resolved. Uh, we do have a question and answer tool. So please feel free to type that in. A few people have already been busy uh, typing away. So I'm going to begin by uh, tackling their questions first. Um, so there's an, a very good question was posed about, can you use this method if you've dropped a dental implant mid-surgery? So one of the things, if you've dropped an implant, you have to render the surface of that clean. And unfortunately, the clean that you will do in a dental surgery setting using detergents and water may change the oxide layer, may not remove the endotoxin that will be on the surface because you've dropped it on the floor. And mostly, most importantly, you would lose characteristics like electro wetting. And no one has yet done any research to show that any sterilizing method can return an implant to its factory finished state. And in our lab, we have examined implants straight out of the manufacturer's provided storage and put them straight into the electron microscope. 
And it's just amazing how readily they can be contaminated because it is a high energy surface. So when you drop on the floor, a lot of stuff gets attracted onto it. So the issue is not that the plasma will damage the surface of the implant. It may change the oxide layer thickness. The issue is that the cleaning is going to change the wetting characteristics of the surface and you probably won't be able to clean it effectively. In other words, you can't remanufacture it back to the manufacturer's specification. So that's part of the challenge with that. It's actually a more deeply rooted problem than it first appears. Um, there's a good question. Can you buy, buy clear window sterilizing bags uh, and are they expensive? So a typical stereo pouch costs around about two and a half dollars, so about $2.50. And those Tyvek patches you saw before, probably a bit hard to see, they're actually clear. You can see right through them at the end of the cycle, the final part of the cycle, because of the way the vacuum is applied, things come out basically vacuum sealed. So unlike a regular Steri packet, when you look at it, you can't necessarily tell by eye if it's been through without close inspection. These you can see instantly if you've had an item go through because it actually has this vacuum sealed approach and they're actually transparent. You can see through them. So you don't need a clear window because they're actually transparent. A bit hard to see that uh, just the way that the photographs were, were taken there. Um, good question here. Are there items which are not suitable or shouldn't be placed in a cold temperature plasma sterilizer? As I said before in the lecture, it's really anything which would condense hydrogen peroxide vapor. So things like cotton pallets, cotton rolls, gauze squares. I mean, those things you would often buy pre-sterilized anyway. And obviously drapes, um, textile drapes, um, surgical gowns, those sorts of things, which again, people would often buy as a single use disposable anyway. All those things would trap and condense vapor. So all those poorest types of items would be out. However, things which are uh, electrical, things which are optical can go through HP plasma sterilizing. And I've even seen a mobile phone put through it, which is a fairly extreme example, I would have, I'd have to say. But obviously a pacemaker is a really good example of you know, electrical item, batteries are put through it. So it's a very, very widely used method, but it's just not for things that can soak things up. So the rule is if it soaks things up, then you wouldn't use it. Um, cost comparison with traditional systems, that's a very good question too. Actually, it's quite comparable uh, to what you'd be you know, getting for a normal you know, 20 or 22 litre pre-vacuum sterilizer. Remembering you're not needing to generate deionized water on site you're not having to use a lot of energy to drive the sterilizer. It runs off you know, a low regular 10 amp power point. So there are actually some energy savings that are tucked away. So it ends up being actually very, very cost competitive, if not anything being actually slightly more efficient because you use a different amount of instrument inventory because you can turn things over more quickly and use them fast without a cooling phase. The total amount of instrument inventory you need is less and that might be very good if you've got some particularly very funky pliers, for example, or microsurgical instruments or things like that. Um, uh, there's a question about uh, calibration and servicing. So obviously that would require some specialized expertise. There is quite an extensive document on how the validation is done. And I think I'd refer you back um, to, the, to the suppliers locally in Australia for information about who best to do it. But it's not a particularly difficult procedure. There are a lot less things that can go wrong in this type of sterilizer than in a conventional pre-vacuum sterilizer. To give you just one example, one of the most common failings over time in a pre-vac is the door seal. That's because it's heated, pressurized, etc. These don't suffer the same types of issues with door seal failures because they're not going through the extremes of temperature, which is one of the big challenges there. Um, if you were using a, a, a laser handpiece, would you place the plug in the end for, for plasma? You'd place it in exactly the same way. So you would use a plug in the end because you're not getting contamination inside the laser handpiece. So there's no reason to introduce things on the inside of it. So you would just use the plug as would be normally supplied to you. 
Um, there is a copy of this uh, presentation available if you contact Ausdent. Uh, it will be on YouTube by the end of, of tonight. So the attendees will be sent uh, the YouTube link as well. So anyone who's uh, looking to watch parts of it again, then you're certainly welcome to do that uh, later on. Okay, so uh, what if the manufacturers uh, suggest other sterilization methods? Are you, re are you required to follow manufacturing instructions? Well, the thing is that you can use this with, as I said, except for items that are obviously porous, this has got much, much wider applicability. And indeed, there are a whole number of examples that you've seen tonight, including common dental instruments, dental hand pieces, and things like that, which are well known to be standard loads that are processed through this type of sterilizer. So there's nothing which is definitely known to be a no-go, except for the cotton pellets, the gauze, the cotton rolls, and things which have got paper in them. Um, there's a question about um, capital layout, consume bills, power usage and servicing. Um, as I've indicated to you, the servicing is extremely simple. The consumables are less. There is no deionized water defeated with the power consumption is less and the total capital outlay is actually pretty much comparable or slightly less than existing pre-vacuum steam sterilizer. So you add up those numbers and clearly there's going to be uh, an advantage going one way. But the main advantage is not just from the simple mathematics of the sterilizer, it's from the way it changes your instrument inventory. So think about why these have been used in hospitals. It's because the microsurgical instruments used in ophthalmic surgery, for example, doing cataract surgery, very small, very delicate, very expensive. So instead of having to have 20 sets of those, you might only have 10 or five because you can turn them around very, very quickly put those in one of those separate little packages, six minute cycle, and there you go. So those are part of the overall understanding of the total thing. Look at instrument inventory and not just the cost of the sterilizer. Um, how are implants sterilized by manufacturers? Uh, lots of different ways. Uh, a number use gamma sterilizing, uh, for example. It's a fairly simple technology because you know, gamma is used for a lot of medical devices. So you can basically produce the final clean implant and then send it off to a commercial facility, which does the gamma sterilization. Because of the nature of the surface layer, you don't often want to use an oxidizing technology. Most manufacturers want to control their oxide layer thickness. So they wouldn't be probably using a technology like this in-house. They're probably going to be sending it off for, for gamma sterilization. However, I've only toured several implant production factories. I haven't been to every one in the world, so I could have missed something in that. Um, cost, cost per cycle, again, it comes back to the understanding of uh, power, deionized water, the cost of the individual packages, and the fact you can load more items into the seven liters or whatever the chamber volume is. That's quite an important con consideration. Uh, as a question asked, can you sterilize impressions? You don't need to ever use an impression uh, as a critical item. So you only need to decontaminate impressions, not sterilize them. Um, so the answer is you wouldn't need to, you can achieve that with existing hospital level disinfectants, you can certainly decontaminate an impression reasonably well. And uh, people haven't published any research on impressions and hydrogen peroxide gas plasma. So there's nothing that I can refer to as a bit of uh, empirical research on that. Um, price range for these units, I think you can um, contact Ausdent. I'm sure they'll have some information available about how all that works. Um, any irritation to patients of tissues? No, because the only residues are water and oxygen at the end of the day. So the answer is no, no problems with that. Um, how do you make sure the internal tubes are dry? If you're using a handpiece lubricator, the end of the handpiece lubrication process is to run compressed air through, and that will remove all the lubricant and any water. So as long as that's gone through, the system tolerance is set so if there is an excessive amount of moisture it won't even begin the cycle it will actually monitor that humidity at the very beginning so there's no way that you could possibly put something in 
that had a large amount of water and the cycle would progress. So it's actually got engineering to stop that sort of thing happening, which is actually pretty good. Um, okay, if instruments are still wet when used on patients, well, they wouldn't be because the um, the final phase, which is the, the what does the vacuum sealing, actually gets rid of all the vapor. We're only telling you that in case there was some sort of gross malfunction and you had to abort a cycle and you opened up and then you would find that the packages might be wet with hydrogen peroxide. But in fact, it will never happen in a normal cycle and they come out ex ex extremely dry. So that's it's really only a hypothetical risk for an aborted cycle. Um, uh, I've obviously, oh, it's a good question. Uh, Thanks for asking it, Rhonda. Obviously, I've been playing with this uh, idea for uh, a while. And uh, yes, I do. I have been playing with, uh, with plasma as a technology for some period of time, as well as with conventional steam sterilizers for um, over 25 years. Uh, do you need to disassemble components? You do exactly the same that you would normally do um, when you lay them for a regular steam, steam uh, sterilizer. Um, let's have a look. Excess oil must be wiped off. Yep, that's not an issue. Let me see, getting down to the end of the questions here. Are items which have come into contact with other cleaning chemicals okay to be sterilized? Well, obviously those uh, other chemicals such as detergents would have been free rinsing. One of the characteristics uh, under the TJ approval for instrument detergents as opposed to domestic detergents is they have to rinse away cleanly without leaving a film behind. So you aren't going to end up with a residue if you are actually using uh, properly approved detergent products. So that's not going to be a problem. Okay, um, the other positive is the dental hand pieces will probably last longer because they won't have heat and moisture. Um, that's a very, very good uh, point, which I didn't mention. Uh, no one has actually done research on the life of handpiece capsules using this method versus without. Um, I would predict it would be better, but I've not actually seen any numbers on that uh, myself. Would you have to use a lubricate? The answer is yes, you still need to have uh, lubrication. It doesn't remove the need to, uh, to lubricate. Um, is moisture inside the triplex head okay to leave? You just need to make sure that you've just uh, finished your use of the triplex by using just the compressed air and not the water. And that's all you all that you need to do in order to achieve enough removal of moisture before it would then go through into the, uh, the package cycle and then as per normal. So that's a, getting some excellent questions show that people have really done their homework and thought really well about, about the topic. Let me just go through and see if there's any others I haven't picked up. Um, Let's have a look. We've got all those. A lot of uh, familiar names and faces here. Nice to see many of you uh, tuned in tonight to have a listen. Um, let's have a look. Uh, we're just uh, a couple of minutes over, over time. If you've got um, a last question, please throw that in there and uh, I'll try to tackle those in the last few minutes and then we can uh, wrap it up for tonight. Just use the Q&A feature. Uh, there is a recent uh, article I've written on this, which again goes through a lot of the technical uh, issues, draws on uh, what is written in the 4187 stand about the validation and the record keeping and covers those sort of technical points. So uh, that can be made available uh, to you as a resource, or you just might want to watch the presentation again on YouTube as well. It will have the question and answers included on the YouTube recording. So if you're interested in that, you'll be able to pick those up as well. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, your lubricants in hand pieces are not gonna be a problem because you're gonna be using a dosed lubricator. So it's going to run at the end with straight compressed air to blow all the excess lubricant out. So that's not going to be a, a problem. If items need to be dry, how, how dry? So we're talking not dripping not dripping with, with moisture. If you are using an ultrasonic cleaner, then rinsing items in quite hot water and leaving them sit, you'll get a lot of the water will evaporate off. That's 
a very, very simple way of getting instruments to dry. Then you can lay them out on some microfiber cloth, for, for example. And here's an excellent question. Is this the way forward for mobile services? Absolutely. If you're in a, a portable scenario, you want something that you can pick up as a sterilizer and carry and wheel around. And this is exactly what this is. You want something that will run on a normal PowerPoint and that doesn't need distilled or deionized water. So you have it exactly. That's a perfect application for this sort of technology. The low, the low current is really very, very useful, as well as the fact it suits the type of uh, so sort of typical small batch loads that one would be wanting to run if you're doing a mobile surface. So that's something that's very, very well suited to. And it's actually a very easy system to assemble. There's really only two pipes that just simply clip on. It's, it's not a complex process. I've done it. I've seen it. It doesn't take a very long time. So it, that simplicity is actually really important to do. So thank you for those uh, great questions and great comments. Um, I think, Jill, we've reached the end of uh, tonight's presentation. Thank you to, uh, to Ausdent uh, for putting tonight on, and I hope you found tonight um, introduce you to why I think cold plasma is a hot topic. I'll leave it over to you, Jill, to uh, say the closing words. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Laurie, that was a fantastic presentation. And I'm sure everybody will be wanting to watch that more than once to get it to get a handle on plasma sterilization. Thank you very much. Good. All right. Thanks, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night. Good night.